I don't know if you've ever noticed, but there's a trick that sometimes preachers will play on the audience. It's a, it's a subtle trick, but now that I'm going to tell you about it, you're going to see it every time, so sorry about that. Here's, here's what it looks like. So, in a conversation about telling us where our mindset should be, when we're talking oftentimes about our worship, thinking about how our minds should be centered around the things that we're doing. We should be putting out of our minds all the thoughts of the world and the cares and concerns that go on around us. We should be thinking about the Lord. We should be thinking about this sermon, the songs we sing, the prayers we offer. They'll say that we need to be focused. And then they'll say that we should not be thinking about where we're going to eat today where we're going to eat, and then they'll get really specific. Here's where it starts to get a bit distracting. They'll say we shouldn't be thinking about in and out We shouldn't be thinking about Chipotle. We shouldn't be thinking about Five Guys or any of the myriad places we could possibly be thinking about where we are going to eat today after the sermon is over. And I don't know if you're like me, but most of the time when I hear the preacher starting to go down that line of reasoning, I'll, I'll think to myself, you know, I wasn't thinking about food, but I am now. <laughs> what I want to do this morning, though, just for, for a few minutes as we begin this lesson, I want to give you free reign to think about your favorite food. I won't tell anybody. I won't turn you in. But I want you for just a few minutes this morning, as we begin this lesson, I want you to think about your favorite food. And as I think about my favorite food, it is hard for me to, to consider all the options that I have out there, all the things that I could possibly be, be wanting to eat. There is one particular food, though, that always kind of sticks in my mind, something that I'm always interested in eating. I don't know, maybe you're like me, maybe, you're, maybe you also want to eat this kind of food. You can think about whatever food you want, by the way. Feel free if you like spaghetti or pizza, whatever it is. But for me, it's hard not to think about a good juicy burger, some crispy salty french fries, and an ice cold drink, something bubbly. And you think about that, I mean, I'm thinking about that now, maybe you're thinking about that too but you're allowed to think about whatever you want. Think about your favorite food. What is it that, that you long for? What is it that you want? What is it that's making your mouth water? And as you think about that, ask yourself this question. Are you hungry? Are you hungry? And maybe the answer is yes. Hopefully the answer is yes. I hope you ate breakfast this morning, <laughs> honestly, because this lesson is all going to be about hunger. Because it's so amazing to me, the God who created our immense and intense craving for food constantly throughout the scriptures uses the language of food and drink to explain to us the amount that we should desire a relationship with him. That's why I'm giving you free reign to be hungry right now. Because every time God uses the language of hunger throughout the Bible, he is tapping into your most vital, your most basic need in life is to eat. He's tapping into that. He's tapping into that because he knows that you get hungry. He knows that you get thirsty. And every time he talks about food and drink, all the way from Genesis in there, in their instructions about what foods to eat and what foods not to eat, all the way to the book of Revelation, the very last chapter of the Bible, where God talks about the thirsty who should come, those who thirst should come. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, the, the language of food is there. It's all over the place. And really, the question for all of us is, is are you hungry? Not physically speaking. I know you'll all be hungry, physically speaking, after this lesson. Maybe you already were. But of course, as suggestion usually goes, I hope you are starting to get even more hungry. And I'm sorry for doing this in the first lesson. I, 
I, th I, I thought maybe about trying to switch with Sean to do it at, during the second lesson, but all day long now, as your, as your stomach is kind of gurgling, I hope it's a reminder for you about this lesson, really a, a reminder for you about your need, your craving for the Lord. That's what I want to talk about this morning for just a few minutes. And let's go to the Proverbs, because the Proverbs has some interesting things to say about hunger, honestly. Proverbs 10, verse 3, the wise writer says, The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the cravings of the wicked. I don't think the wise writer there is just talking about physical food. I don't think he's just explaining to us how the Lord is going to take care of the physical needs of those who are righteous. I think what the wise writer there is talking about here is that we need to fill ourselves up with the Lord. When we are righteous, when our will aligns with the Lord God's will, He is going to feed us. He's going to care for us. He's going to nourish us and give us everything that we could possibly need. If our will, our desire is counter to the Lord's, though, He's going to thwart us. He is going to block us at every turn. And it, it really goes along nicely with what Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. Of course, you know this verse is where we were going. It, it, it's appropriate that we start here. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You see the connection there between that proverb and this verse of Jesus. The righteous will be fed. They will not go hungry. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Our satisfaction comes from the Lord. When our desire, when, when what's on our spiritual menu lines up with what God has defined as being righteous and good, then he's going to feed us. He's going to satisfy us. He's going to take care of our deepest cravings when our cravings line up with his will. And that's an important shift for us. Because the Bible talks a lot about cravings. The Bible talks a lot about things that we could want, things that might distract us. We'll talk about a few of those things this morning for just a, a bit. But when our desire really lines up with God's will, then, then he's going to take care of us. He's not going to withhold from us. He's not going to prevent feeding us. He's going to take care of our deepest needs. And so we need to fill ourselves up with the Lord. You think about the way that you eat. Do you just kind of nibble? When, you have, when you're faced with, with the meal that, that you were just thinking about a few minutes ago, when you're staring at that, you're sitting across from the table from a plate full of whatever that is that you're thinking about, do you just take little tiny bites of it? Do you kind of just, just snack on it just a little bit? Or do you devour it? We use language like that because we all know what it's like to just fill ourselves up, to engorge ourselves, to just, just get stuffed with that food. And we need to fill ourselves up with the Lord in the same way. And it's amazing when you go to the, the Psalms and you, you view the way that David viewed the Lord and the way that David viewed his relationship with God. Look at Psalm 63 in the first handful of verses there. David uses this language of food, and you can just hear the, the longing and the craving just dripping off of every line. He says in Psalm 63, verse 1, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your glory and power, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Does it, does it seem like David is just sort of nibbling on the Lord's blessing there, or is he just satisfied? He's using this language, and we in our modern sort of carb culture, you know, carb conscious culture, we kind of 
maybe balk at this a little bit, but he says in verse 5, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. You know what that's like. Don't pretend that you don't. <laughs> you know what that's like. When you get some meal, yeah, it's fattening, but it's a guilty pleasure. And you just fill yourself up with it. And the way that David talks about his relationship with God is the same way. I, I want you so badly, I can just taste it. I'm thirsty for you, oh God, as he begins that song. Is that the kind of relationship that you have with the Lord? Here's, a, here's a, some food for thought. But I'm fine. Uh, here's some food for thought. What does my diet consist of? Think about this for yourself. Just ask yourself, spiritually speaking, what does your diet consist of? Do you fill yourself up with the Lord? Do you do that regularly? You think about the language that Jesus is using there in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, as he's talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Do you hunger and thirst every single day, multiple times a day? Are you hungering and thirsting now? Will you be hungering and thirsting in six hours from now? Will you be hungering and thirsting tomorrow? Think about that from the standpoint of your spiritual life, your walk with the Lord. Do you fill yourself up with the Lord as often as you eat? Do you, do you consume the Lord's word? Do you think about serving him and working in his kingdom? Do you do things that are spiritually nourishing as often as you eat? And I think that's why God uses the language of hunger and thirst throughout the Bible, is just to remind us the frequency and the urgency and the craving that we should have for following after the Lord. And what is it that you fill yourself up on? We'll talk about maybe some negative things in a, in a little bit that we can fill ourselves with, but, but do you feast on the Lord and his word? Do you study your Bible throughout the week? Are you calling people on the phone? Are you getting involved in people's lives? Are you being the kind of, of worker in his kingdom that, that you could be and should be? Just some things to think about here. But then we move on to another proverb that I think is also helpful for us. Proverbs 16, verse 26, the wise writer says, A worker's appetite works for him. His mouth urges him on. I love this. I love this so much. You ever th have you ever been out just a day of working? You're, you're, you're sweaty, you're gross. You know, in Phoenix, that's easy to do. You're sweaty, you're gross. You're just, you're, you've been out working all day long. Maybe you've been in the attic. Maybe you've been in the backyard. You're dirty. What do you want? You want a big, giant glass of water, maybe. Maybe you're, maybe you're starting to get shaky. Maybe you're starting to get a little hangry. If you don't know what hanger is, just come talk to me about it later. But maybe you're starting to feel that way. You're getting, you're, you're, your blood sugar's a bit low. Your, your mouth is parched. And all you want to do is get something to eat and get something to drink. And I think that's what this proverb is talking about. I think it's talking about the fact that that when we're working, when we're out there doing the work, it's our, it's our mouth that keeps us going. It's our mouth that keeps us sustained. And, and we want satisfaction. We, we want it very badly. It kind of reminds me of when around the Olympics times, you'll, you'll hear about the diet of some of the top athletes. I read a, an article about Michael Phelps some years back how at one point for lunch, he was eating like the equivalent of like six normal human meals all at one time for lunch. And then for dinner, he did basically the same thing. He was consuming about like 10,000 calories a day, which you could just get a whole bunch of us together and none of us should ever on our own eat just even a fraction of that. And he was eating that every single day. And he would say to the reporter in that article, I eat, I sleep, and I swim. That's all I do. <laughs> and when somebody is operating at that kind of a level, you can see why eating, sleeping, and the work that they do are all that consumes them. And it has me asking the question, do I have an insatiable appetite for the Lord? That's the next thing we need to think about. We need to fill ourselves with the Lord, but we need to have an appetite that's just constantly insatiable, that's just always pushing us on, pushing us forward. 
Because that's what happens when, when we're hard at work. You know, it's not just like you eat in the morning and then you spend the whole day out working and then you just never think about food the rest of the day. You're always thinking about food. Food's always motivating you and pushing you. And it really just goes, I think, with what Peter was talking about in 1 Peter chapter 2 as he's encouraging us to look to the babies, <laughs> to look to the, to the smallest among us for guidance on this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, Peter says, Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. We need to desire and, and want what the Lord is providing to us like, like a baby wants milk. And why do we do this? Why, why do we continue to desire the Lord in the way that we do? Why do we continue to desire his word, to continue to desire all the blessings that he gives to us? It's because, as he says there in verse 3, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. When you get a taste of the goodness of God, it whets your appetite for more. And you think about the next step you can take and the next meal you can take. Have you ever, my dogs are terrible about this. You give them even the, the most delicious piece of food and they'll swallow it in one bite. <laughs> you never see a dog who just, you give them a bunch of food and they just sit and savor it. They don't do that. They want it and they want it right now and they want to swallow it. That's all they want to do. And sometimes we do the same thing. If you've, if you've ever seen me with a, big plate of french fries, you'll know I don't savor those things. I just, they, 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 they go right in, and they're gone. That's what I do with french fries. But when you get a meal that is just amazing, and you sit and savor it, you sit and roll it in your mouth, you, you, you kind of, you don't want it to end. I once had a meal at a, at a restaurant. It took us like, what, five hours to eat? It was the most amazing meal I've ever had. Little tiny bites, little tiny things, and you just would would eat them, and you just wanted it to never end because it was so amazing. And that's what happens. When you savor the goodness of the Lord, if you've tasted that the Lord is good, it makes you want more. By the way, that, that rolling over in your mouth or that kind of savoring, it, it reminds me of meditation is really what it reminds me of. It reminds me of, of rolling over or meditating on the Lord. The more we meditate on God, the more we've tasted the goodness of God, the more we want more, the more our appetite grows. And that's what Peter's talking about here. Like babies who just want milk all the time. You'd think that their desire would be somehow satisfied and you could go like maybe a day, maybe a couple weeks without feeding them again, but no. They want more food after they've already eaten. And that's the challenge for all of us. It would be a real shame if this was the only time you ate this week. It would be a real shame if this was the only moment where you feasted on the goodness of the Lord was this time this week. And I hope that's not the case. And as all of the language of eating and drinking and thirsting and craving throughout the Bible urges us to do, this needs to be a daily thing that we do. Not, not our gathering here necessarily, but your feasting, your tasting the goodness of the Lord. Because you know what? The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, talks about a category of people who, who they've tasted that the Lord is good, but they, they don't have an appetite for it anymore. Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, the Hebrew writer says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. You know, we talk about that verse. It's a very scary verse. It's a very frightening verse, I think, to think about. How somebody can fall away and, and not want to come back, not be able to come back, because they've once tasted the goodness of God. They've had the experience of what God has to offer, and they've said, I'm okay. Thanks, but no thanks. We need to be very careful that our appetite, as this second food for thought question asks, 
we need to be very careful that our appetite is increasing. Is your appetite for the Lord increasing? There are people that I've known throughout my life who, into their, into their old age, it seems like their appetite for the Lord has just no end. They're always thinking about God. They, they dedicate themselves to his study. They want to know more, so that not that they can win some kind of Bible trivia contest, but so that they can serve better. They want to be the kind of worker in the kingdom that is always propelled by the goodness of God. And I've known people like that. I've also known people who, yeah, they've tasted the goodness of the Lord, and they don't want any part of it. And who am I? Who are you? Is your appetite for the Lord always increasing? Like a newborn baby, are you just wanting more and more and more? Or are you kind of, are you doing like the, the keto diet or like the Atkins diet or the low-carb diet where you're just, I'll just get a little bit of the Lord God in my life. I'll just get a little bit of Bible study. Maybe I'll just study just a little bit here and then I'm, I'm going to fast for the rest of the week. I'm good. That's no way to, to nourish ourselves. That's no way to be spiritually strong. You need to be the kind of high-calorie Christian who is constantly feeding on the Lord. That, that needs to define who we are. And, and if, if you're not increasing in your appetite, here's a, here's a good challenge or a good recommendation for you. Find, find somebody here who is increasing in their appetite and spend some time with them. Spend some time around somebody who's zeal and passion for the Lord just has no end. Spend some time around them, because honestly, you probably weren't thinking about a, a hamburger and french fries like 15, 20 minutes ago, but you were now. That's how, that's how we can be suggestive for each other. We can, we can influence each other. We can, we can plant that seed of craving in each other's lives, and I think that's why the Bible tells us so many times to encourage one another, lift each other up, to push each other forward so that, so that we can all develop that kind of craving for the Lord. So then the last proverb here. This is my favorite picture, by the way. One who is full loathes honey, but to one who is hungry, everything bitter is sweet. That's in Proverbs 27, verse 7. You know how that works. You've probably been there before, right? Maybe, maybe after Thanksgiving, a couple weeks, just think, just think a few weeks back. Maybe you had way too much turkey, and you're just full, and you're sitting there on the couch, like you had to unsnap the belt, and you kind of you wore your sweatpants that day, or whatever it was, like to get ready for that moment, and you're just full. And somebody says, you want a piece of pie? And you're like, I couldn't. I couldn't even think about it. Even the thought of pie is like, no, no, sorry. I'm going to have to wait. I need to digest a little bit. And that's what this proverb is talking about. The one who is full loathes honey. Something that, is, that should be just our, our utmost desire is like, oh, I can't even. I couldn't even think about it. But when you're hungry, when you're hungry, even something as just gross and unappetizing as, you know, Brussels sprouts or something like that, you know, you think about that and you're like, by the way, I love Brussels sprouts, but I'm just, I'm pandering to the crowd here. As you... As you think about the things that like, maybe you don't want to eat, when you're hungry, you really want those things, don't you? Like, you're not going to be picky. If you're starving, you'll take whatever you can get. Here's, here's the encouragement that I want us to take away from this proverb. Don't settle for junk food. Don't settle for junk food. Don't, as we tell our kids sometimes, don't fill yourself up before the meal. You know that restaurants are awesome at this. They'll, They'll set down your kids, they'll, they'll, they'll put in front of them like bread, and they'll give them all kinds of snacks before the meal starts and everything. And by the time food actually shows up, they're so full because like, they've stuffed themselves on bread. We need to not do that, spiritually speaking. Spiritually speaking, we need to not settle for junk food. A couple weeks ago, we talked from Numbers chapter 12, Numbers 12, where Moses was dealing with the accusations of Aaron and Miriam. The chapter before that, though, in the history of the children of Israel, you'll remember the, the intense complaining that they did. 
the intense complaining that they did. Numbers 11, verse 4. This is kind of what I'm talking about in this point. Numbers 11, verse 4. Now, the rebel that was among them had a strong craving. They had a craving, but it wasn't for the right thing. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Just see the, I can hear, sorry, Ashlyn, I can hear Ashlyn saying this, just sitting there across, oh, like all I have is this manna, you know, like I've provided this meal for you, and all you can think of is, oh, the, the food I used to eat so long ago. We do this spiritually speaking sometimes, where we look back, we look around at all of the food around us, all of the, the distraction around us, whatever's going on on our smartphones, whatever's going on on social media, whatever's going on on the television, whatever's going on at our jobs, whatever Fox News is saying or CNN is saying, whatever we're seeing in the newspaper, we have all these distractions around us that fill our time and then we say, oh, I just have no time for studying the Lord and studying my Bible and connecting with others. I have no time, I'm so busy. Are we really? Or are we pining away for, for the junk food around us? Are we missing the satisfying food we have right in front of us? Because as the Lord God is pointing his people toward milk and honey, all they want to do is look back to, to leeks and onions. That's what they want to look back to. And we do the same thing, don't we? It's so easy for us to settle for junk food. It's so easy for us to look around and just get distracted by all of the things around us. And I, I don't know, if you're, if you're anything like me, this is something that I struggle with as well. I struggle with the fact that, that there are things around me that just can get me distracted. Philippians. Paul, in the book of Philippians, in chapter 3, verse 18, he has some important things to say about this. When he says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory in the, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Paul in Romans talks about how people have an appetite for destruction. And here Paul is talking about people whose God is their belly. What do you really crave? And are you settling for junk food? Are you filling yourself up on empty calories, really? Because it's easy to fill your time, fill your mind, fill, fill your schedule and your calendar up with things that don't matter. And I'm, I'm pointing all the fingers back at myself on this one, because I, I deal with this too. I struggle with this too. It's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to just fill myself up with the pursuits of life. And then when God has honey to give me, by the way, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb, his word and the things that we can gain from his word. When I look at this book, which is honey, and I'm so full by all the, the junk food I've been eating, I'm not going to gain the benefit of the Lord and his, his word in my life. And sometimes that means just saying no to things. Honestly, sometimes it means saying no to, to the commitments we've, we've gotten ourselves wrapped up in. It means saying no to that television show that everybody's been watching. It means saying no to pulling out our phones and getting distracted by that person we once knew 20 years ago who, if we had not had social media or the internet, we would have forgotten about them long ago, but we really needed to spend 15 minutes just talking to them, this person that, that we haven't thought of in years while we ignore our kids who are trying to get our attention across the table from us. You've been there, I've been there, where we spend too much time doing things that don't matter. Here's another thought, though. Maybe you've filled up with junk food thinking it was religious service to the Lord. Here's where I want to encourage every one of us to take a, take a step further than maybe we've taken before. 
it's easy to it's easy to read a verse a day you read a verse and then you say okay check checked off the box there i've done my done my part really you just basically ate a jelly bean that's all you did you didn't feast you didn't nourish yourself on the lord's word you didn't really study if all you're doing is reading a verse there are these like devotional books where They'll go through every day, you read something, but they're just fluff. It's like cotton candy. It's meaningless. It's not valuable. I want to I challenge us to really get deep. Really get into the meaty parts of God's word. No longer, no longer distracted by the milk, no longer distracted by the cotton candy and the fluff, but really getting into the meat. And that needs to be in our own personal Bible studies. That needs to be in our sermons. That needs to be in our Bible classes. When we sit around... As men, when you sit around as ladies having a conversation about the Lord and his word, get deep. Get into the nourishing parts of God's word. Quit scratching the surface. Quit thinking that you're doing the work that you should be doing if all you're doing is just scratching a little bit and then moving on. We all need to get deep into the Lord's word. And as mature Christians... As people who have been around the block for a little bit, we need to be doing that even more and encouraging that of those who are, who are still growing up in the faith. But have I filled myself up on empty calories? The Lord constantly is asking us this question in his word. Are you hungry? Do you want a relationship with me bad enough like you want food? And this morning, I hope that you haven't just thought about cheeseburgers and french fries. I hope really you've thought about the meaty, weightier matters in God's law. The opportunities you have to feast on the Lord, to fill yourself up with him, to continue to increase your appetite for spiritual things, and to to leave behind the junk food of this world. Focus on him and be a, a nourished, satisfied Christian. I'm hungry. <laughs> I hope you're hungry too. And this is the kind of lesson that that at the end of the year really just has you kind of asking that question like, what is my hunger going to do in 2022? What what am I hungry for in the next year? Where am I going? Where do I want to be? What kind of spiritually mature Christian do I want to be in this next year? And as you think about that for yourself, my hope and my prayer for you is that you will find satisfaction, as Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. Thanks for your attention this morning. Please take out your songbooks. Turn to the number that's been announced. If you are just sitting down to the table, if you're just starting to feast on the Lord and his word, if you've tasted that the Lord is good and you're not yet a child of his, then we encourage you to set your course, to start following him today. Today is the only day we know we will have, and if you know that today is the day of your salvation, then we encourage you to come forward and be baptized this morning while we stand and sing.